Are you sitting the GAMSAT and you realize you'll be running out of questions soon? This is a really common problem and the advice that I like to give my students is to attempt questions multiple times. And when you re-attempt the question, one thing that you should do is ask yourself, can I solve this problem in a different way? And that's what we're going to do today in this video. I'm going to go through an example of a question and solve it. And once we've done that, we'll revisit that same question and see, can we solve it in a different way? Okay, so here's the question. Okay, I like to start off by looking at the question first. Which of the following is the likely pair of products resulting from the ozone lysis of methyl 9 octadecanoate? Now I can see from the question and the answer options themselves that this is a very visual type of question. It's probably pattern recognition. And my initial thoughts would be to just use the reaction sequence provided. Okay. If you were a bit worried um, in terms of just knowing if that's relevant, you could, for example, have a look at the question and you might look for references to ozonolysis just to make sure that we're looking at the right reaction. And you can see that in the text above it, it does talk about ozonolysis. Okay, so I would be reasonably confident that I can use the reaction sequence provided. There are other hints as well that we're on the right track because if you look at the reactant, you can see that the main, I guess, feature that they are pointing out is that double bond. And you can see that there's a double bond in our reactant as well. And we can also see that in our answer options, there are two products. We can see that in the reaction sequence that there are two products and that they have these carbon double bond oxygen um, functional groups, the carbonyl groups. Those carbonyl groups are quite prominent in our answer options as well. You can see them everywhere. Okay, so that's a really good indication. We can really just jump straight to the reaction sequence and see what's going on. Now, pattern recognition is really about comparing what's similar, what's different, and also making generalizations. So if I looked at the reaction sequence, I can kind of see that what's the same are these carbons. Okay, I can see that these carbons uh, don't really change. Okay, so whatever was attached to those carbons is the same. Uh, it looks like the double bond doesn't change either. However, just by looking at the reaction sequence, it looks like it's been split into two. And once it's been split into two fragments, these guys come along, these oxygens. Okay, so they weren't there before, so that's something new. So it looks like they split into two fragments. Each fragment is now um, newly double bonded to an oxygen. So I'm gonna take this, this will be my pattern, or this is the generalization that I'm going to use, and I'm going to apply that to the molecule that I've been given. Because this is an online test, I won't be able to, or you as well, you won't be able to annotate on the screen. So I'm just going to draw on the space over here just to replicate what I would do on my piece of paper or my whiteboard. I would probably draw out this molecule again, and I would draw it in a way that better resembles the example that we've been provided or the reaction sequence that's been provided. So what, what I mean by that is I would probably look at that double bond and I would draw around that double bond in a similar way to what we saw in the um, reaction sequence provided like this. Okay, so what I've just drawn is just the double bond with the carbons over here, that section really. Okay, on the left hand side, I can see that the carbon is attached to a hydrogen. I might put that at the top. You could put it at the bottom, but it doesn't really matter. So that's the hydrogen that I just drew. And then you've got the other group that's attached, which is that string of CH2s. Whoops, it's a string of CH2s, seven of those. And then you've got a methyl group just at the end. On the other side, you've also got another hydrogen. I'll just put that at the top. And you've also got the rest of that molecule, which is the CH2 seven of those 
and we've got the C double bond oxygen OCH3. That's an ester group, by the way. Okay, so I've just redrawn this, and the reason why I've done this is because it will make it easier for me to understand what goes where eventually. So I can see that the you know I, I can generalize that if I'm given an, a similar reaction, this double bond gets split. So I'm just going to split this molecule in half. I'm going to redraw those halves. I know from the reaction sequence that the things attached don't do anything, so they're going to remain the same. Right now, I'm going to leave this open. Uh, oh no, I'm just going to add the oxygen. So we know that it's going to now be attached to an oxygen okay, from the reaction sequence. And the other side is going to be the same. So I'll have a carbon, hydrogen, I'll have this chain, and then I've got this ester group as well. It doesn't have to be perfect, so long as, so long as you can see the, um, the details are okay. Okay, so these are the products that I would expect to see. Now it's just a matter of looking at the answer options and picking the right one. And in this case, it's just option D. Okay, I'm not going to go through too much. Let's just show you why it's option D just really quickly, and I'll just match up the groups essentially. So from the thing that I've just drawn, you've got the CH3 group that caps at the end. You've got the string of CH2s, seven of them. That's attached to your carbon, attached to the double bond oxygen, that's that. And you've got your hydrogen. Okay, so that's looking good. And then on the right hand side, you've got your uh, hydrogen, that one will be this attached to the carbon with the double bond oxygen, which is this guy. And then you've got your string of CH2O7, that's this. And then you've got your ester group. Okay. So the answer is D. So I hope you can see by using pattern recognition and generalizing, we can draw out these structures and predict essentially what we would get. Okay, so that's one way we can solve this problem. But as I said at the beginning of this video, it's always good to go back to questions and try them again, you know, get more bang for your buck. So let's get rid of all this and have a think to ourselves, could we have solved this a different way? And solving things in a different way is good because it means that you'll be more flexible. You know, if you're in the exam and you're trying it a certain way and you kind of get to a bit of a dead end, then you can switch gears a little bit, try a different method, and that in itself might help. So what's another thing we could have done? Well, I realized that if you'd read the, the rest of this, so if you read um, past the reaction, they start talking about the actual reactants themselves and what kind of products you would get. So let's have a quick read. If all four single bonds of the two doubly bound carbons are themselves attached to carbons, the alkene is said to be tetra substituted. Now, what this is referring to um, is referring to these carbons. Okay, so those are the two doubly bound carbons. Okay, so the things that I've just underlined, they're the two doubly bound carbons. If they are attached to carbons, so I think what they're trying to say is these attachments, okay, so if they're attached to carbons, then this alkene would be considered a to be tetra substituted. Okay, so I'm going to draw an example of what uh, tetra substituted would mean, so hopefully it makes sense. What they're trying to say is if you had your doubly bonded carbons and they were attached to carbons themselves. Okay, now it doesn't matter what else is attached to them, it could be a CH3 or it could be a CH2, CH3, just making this up. Okay, so if those are actually attached to four carbons, you would call this thing a tetra-substituted alkene. Okay, so that's a tetra-substituted alkene. Let's keep on going. When an alkene with tetra-substituted double bond is subjected to ozonolysis, two ketone fragments result. So what they're trying to tell us is if the reactant is a certain or is categorized a certain thing, in this case a tetra substituted alkene, then you would get certain products, in this case two ketones. 
What happens uh, with other scenarios if we keep on going? Under similar circumstances, a tri-substituted double bond results in one ketone and one aldehyde. Okay, so they don't tell us what tri-substituted means directly, but we can kind of guess that tri-substituted probably means that of the four bonds that these carbons could have, three of them are carbons and then the other must be a hydrogen. Okay, so this would be a tri-substituted double bond double bond. So in this scenario you would get um, one ketone and one aldehyde. Obviously it's important for you to recognize what those look like, you know, what does a ketone, what does an aldehyde look like, um, so that you can understand this. Okay, then the next thing is about di-substituted double bonds. A again, I think we can assume that di-substituted probably means that two of them, okay, so perhaps this one and this one, okay? Two of the four have carbons and we've got two hydrogens. In this scenario, you get two aldehydes or a ketone and a formaldehyde. For those who have forgotten what a formaldehyde is, I'll just draw this out. I may as well draw out what a, an aldehyde is as well, just really quickly. So a formaldehyde, or formaldehyde I should say, is really this molecule. Okay, that's formaldehyde. Okay, an aldehyde is something that follows this form. This is an aldehyde. So uh, this R group can be pretty much anything, so it could be a chain of carbons, but you need to have this group. So you have to have a carbon double bond to an oxygen and attached to a hydrogen. So that's an aldehyde group. A ketone would be something like this. Okay, where you've got a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and on either side of it, it's attached to chains of carbons as well. Okay, so this is a ketone. Okay, so this is important for us to be able to um, answer using this method. So the method that we are going through right now is we're, we're really using verbal reasoning, okay? We're, we're using evidence in the text or using logic in the text, I should say, uh, to try to predict what's gonna happen or, or if this is going to be correct, all right? So let's go back to our question and we'll look at our reactant. Our reactant over here, if you recall, we drew this out. I shouldn't have got rid of it, but when we drew this out, remember that on either side we had a hydrogen and then we had those groups. I'll just draw them in again, just real quick. Okay. So, how would we classify this particular reactant? This is a di-substituted double bond. And in the case of a di-substituted double bond, we would have two aldehydes produced, or we'd have a ketone and a formaldehyde. Okay, so we need those things to be true. Okay, that's going to be how we're gonna solve this problem. So now, instead of looking at the visuals of the product, like trying to predict what the structure is gonna look, we're going to classify the products and then see if that matches the reasoning or the, you know, the information that's been provided. Is consistent. So if I looked at option A, for example, this molecule, this very first one here, has the carbonyl uh, carbonyl group in the middle of the chain. This is a ketone. Okay, that's a ketone. This is also a ketone. Okay, and over here we also have another ketone that that's in the middle there. So it's a ketone. It's in the middle of the group. It's a ketone. And technically speaking, you could look at this as well. That's an ester group, okay, which is not really that relevant. Um, in option B, it's a bit difficult to see, but this, if you recall, when we have a C a double bond oxygen and a hydrogen, that's an aldehyde group. Okay, so that's an aldehyde. Okay, and there's also an ester on this side. Okay, we'll keep on going. 
This group over here in option C is actually a carboxylic acid. So this is a carboxylic acid. Okay, on the other side, we have a ketone. Oops. And we have an ester, ketone ester, okay? Ketone, ester. Okay, the last one, which we know is the answer. The first one, we've got the C double one oxygen with the hydrogen. This is an aldehyde. And again, your C double one oxygen with the hydrogen, this is also an aldehyde. And we've also got the ester there. Okay. So hopefully you can see that the option that makes the most sense is the one that produces two products that have the aldehyde group in there or that can be classified as aldehydes. That's another reason why we can choose D as our best option. So uh, I've just showed you there are two different ways that we can solve this problem. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you did, please give me a like and subscribe. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. All right, well, thanks very much, and I'll see you in the next video.